A few of you have asked, what's going on with Ammon Bundy lately? Well, we thought today was a good day for an update on the St. Luke's lawsuit against him. Short answer, a lot more paperwork and not much participation from Bundy. Speaking of lawsuits, Simplot is in the middle of a stinky situation. One of their feedlots is apparently soiling the Snake River, which could be a violation of the Clean Water Act. Speaking of not so clean water, we're checking back in on what Boise's wastewater is now being used for now that the COVID emergency is officially flushed. Like screenwriters working on the set of an unfinished movie, pages just keep getting added to the saga that is St. Luke's versus Ammon Bundy. The original lawsuit filed by St. Luke's Health System back in May of last year against the anti-government activist has had several chapters and a lot of court filings since then. We've broken down about, well, pretty much most of it about a month ago, and you can find that story on our YouTube channel, including a timeline that began with the People's Rights Network days-long protest outside St. Luke's Boise in March of 2022 because of a child taken in there by Child Protective Services. Well, it caused the hospital to go on lockdown for a couple of hours on March 15th. So St. Luke's filed the civil lawsuit against Bundy and his People's Rights Network for defamation because even after that protest, St. Luke's claims Bundy and his friend Diego Rodriguez continued to harass and threaten St. Luke's doctors and staff. Of course, there was a ton of paperwork involved with the civil lawsuit, which had to be served to Bundy over the last year, and that paperwork piled up. The Gem County Sheriff, well, then he re briefly refused to serve those papers anymore. And the judge overseeing this case issued a civil arrest warrant for Bundy to appear since he has refused to participate at all in this lawsuit, a warrant that has also not yet been served. Judge Lynn Norton then issued a default judgment against Bundy last month, again, because he hasn't shown up at all, and ordered him to appear for a deposition to decide damages in this lawsuit. Okay, so that's a bit of the brief backstory, and that brings us to today. The day scheduled for that deposition, where you can see Bundy didn't show. There's the Ada County Court reporter waiting to shorthand all of his answers, and there's the backdrop, which would have been behind him, and what you'd see in that video recording to make it all look official and stuff. So yeah, nobody was there for that deposition. Anyway, that was supposed to happen today. And according to St. Luke's attorneys, he was supposed to turn in discovery documents on Monday. Neither happened. In addition, yesterday, St. Luke's attorneys filed more paperwork. One of them, a declaration by Holland and Hart's Eric Stidham, claiming Bundy is actively trying to hide his assets to avoid paying possible penalties involved with this lawsuit. And he's supposedly doing that by setting up shell companies with the help of a friend in Wyoming and Idaho to hold those assets in trust so they would not be able to be accessed. Yesterday's filing contained documents provided by Prime Corporate Services, a Utah company which specializes in setting up businesses. And they show a company called Farmhouse Holdings LLC was recently established under another recently established company called White Barn Enterprises LLC. Farmhouse is based in Wyoming. White Barn is based in Post Falls, Idaho. But both companies show the manager as one Aaron Welling. White Barn Enterprises recently bought Bundy's five-acre home in Emmett, worth an estimated $1.2 million. Bundy is paying nearly $2,600 in rent to live there and apparently to hold long-term campout cookouts. So why did Bundy sell his home? Well, because back in November, a lien was put on his property for failing to pay attorney's fees after not complying with a court order from the month before. So to get out from under that lien, Bundy transferred ownership of his Emmett property to White Barn Enterprises. The declaration for yesterday also shows emails from December showing Aaron Welling asking a representative of Prime Corporate Services about moving assets to White Barn Enterprises or to Farmhouse Holdings, to which it was explained the Wyoming holding company is for anonymity and people can't see you as the member or your mailing address. That's kind of how it works with Wyoming LLCs. Apparently, you can just hide stuff. That beneficial ownership, the email went on, means everything in the Wyoming company can be included in a trust and they can avoid probate or basically avoid any of those assets being taken. Aaron Welling, by the way, also owns Potter's Construction in Emmett, which was also recently organized under Farmhouse Holdings, that Wyoming company. So Aaron Welling, whose name is on all three of these companies, also happens to be a good friend of Ammon Bundy. So today we reached out to Bundy, who is still not arrested and was just hanging out at home. We wanted to ask him about this declaration and whether he was familiar with White Barn Enterprises or Farmhouse Holdings or even Potter's Construction. I'm familiar with Potter's Construction. 
and White Barn because White Barn bought my house. And Potter's Construction is a company that does construction here in Emmett. Okay. And I know the owner. Who's the owner? Aaron Welling. Isn't he the former treasurer of your campaign for governor? He is. Are you familiar with emails uh, between him and Prime Corporate Services talking about moving assets into either of these companies? No, I'm not. According to some of these filings, uh, White Barn Enterprises is listed as the manager of Farmhouse Holdings, which is listed as the manager of Potter's Construction. So they're, they're connected. Okay. It doesn't sound like it's anything illegitimate. I don't, I don't know really what he does with the assets. I, all I know is I sold him my property uh, legitimately, and I have no idea what he does with his business. St. Luke's put a lien on my home, and I paid the lien off, and I sold it. Okay, so the last of that was this, I asked him about this idea of him creating these shell companies to hide the assets. You know, what did he have to say about that? He claimed it was just garbage. He had this company from what, he says Welling had this company from what Bundy understands long before he had any trouble with his home or anything else. That's what Bundy said. But that long before isn't exactly accurate. Looking at the registration filings for these companies, White Barn Enterprises in Post Falls and Farmhouse Holdings in Wyoming, they were both established in July of 2022, which was two months after the lawsuit was filed by St. Luke's and two months after Bundy apparently decided he wasn't going to participate in the lawsuit in any way. It wasn't worth it to him, he said. He told us and others he wouldn't lose any more money fighting it. Today's failure to appear at the deposition led to another failure to comply filing. By the way, 10 days ago, Bundy asked to move this lawsuit to a federal court, and he's still waiting to see if that happens. He's also told us he's offered St. Luke's everything he owns to pay for the lawsuit, which isn't much anymore. And St. Luke's has told us, well, it's not really about the money anymore. Well, it's not really about the money. I should say it is about the money, but it's not really about getting that money from Bundy. Stidham has been clear. This case going forward and the compelling Bundy to participate in a deposition, all of that is about pointing out the grift of the People's Rights Network. And this declaration is part of that. They want to bring to light how much money Bundy and Rodriguez have made and now hiding as a professional extremist and conflict entrepreneur. And if you're familiar with what happened with Alec Jones, St. Luke seems to be following the same playbook. So when the sun starts to come out, Idahoans start to hit the waterways. Some are certainly safer than others. Dangers that could be due to swift currents or dirty water. Polluted water specifically has gotten the attention of the Snake River Waterkeeper. It's a nonprofit. They created a swim guide on their website that shows you where Idaho waters are clean and safe and also waterways you should avoid. But their focus now is aimed in Grandview, which is just near Simplot's feedlot along the Snake River. Snake River water keepers say the feedlot is polluting the river, and it's a violation of the Clean Water Act. Andrew Bartline learned they're now filing a lawsuit. It's a two cattle guard cross leading up to an aptly named Grand View. That's where the mountains overlook a feedlot operation operated by Simplot and abutting the Snake River, a waterway known for premier recreation upstream. Rafting, fishing. Um, swimming, that sort of thing. Buck Ryan founded the Snake River Water Keepers. Well, I love that part of the river. I want the river down here to be, to have the same kind of recreational values and, and the same kind of uh, hype and excitement around it. But it's not. And Buck pins part of the problem on pollution produced by cattle. There are a lot of them. It's hallmarked by Simplot's Grandview feedlot. It caps out at 150,000 heads. We filed our complaint just yesterday. Um, against Simplot in the federal court here in Boise. The lawsuit says Simplot's stockyard produces nearly 50,000 tons of manure each year. Rain and snow runoff push manure pollutants into streams and canals. It all feeds into the nearby snake. And right now, the facility does not hold a permit to pollute a drop of any pollutant into the river. And so the outward message to the public is that they are a zero discharge facility, meaning they contain all of that manure that's produced, uh, millions of pounds a day potentially. It's too many cattle on too small a piece of land for that to be possible. By not having a permit, the lawsuit says Simplot is violating the Clean Water Act and have been continuously for more than five years. If they have the permit, all of a sudden they have to actually monitor and report exactly what they're discharging from their facility. And that's critical. Right now they can do anything they want and the public is unaware of and unable to find out through records requests what is happening to the river. 
Simplot says they cannot comment on pending legal matters. However, they write the 208 in an email, quote, The Snake River has served as a backdrop for our operations in southern Idaho for more than 90 years. It provides important water and nutrients for not only our farms and ranches, but also for many of our farming partners and a number of communities where we operate and our employees call home. And that's actually where both sides agree. So it's given a lot to me and it's sort of a way of giving back. But Buck's concerned about what's ahead. Because these cattle guards, they don't stop the runoff. We're just going to be poisoning ourselves for the future because that's where our drinking water comes from. The lawsuit further details samples taken upstream from the feedlot and downstream from the feedlot. It compares them. They say the river shows high levels of E. coli downstream from that feedlot. The lawsuit also says, Brian, that every day that uh, this is violated, it's like $64,000 in fines. That's hmm. from the Clean Water Act. Well, five years, 60 days later, that's like a $120 million lawsuit. So it's a very sizable, very sizable sum. It is, and I can imagine Simplot's not really too keen on talking about it right now. Yeah, they said they're not going to talk about pending legal matters. Yep. They know the details. They're aware of it. Um, but, yeah, they gave us that brief statement there. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. This week, National Public Health Emergency for COVID came to an end. It's not a signal that COVID has gone forever by any means, but it is a sign things are not as serious as they probably once were, thus no longer an emergency. We've seen several comments uh, it's that you've texted into us about this since the announcement. One of those, though, has caught the eye of here on the 208, specifically Joe Parrish, because we wanted to find out about, the, about this stuff. We've been looking at wastewater treatment facility in Boise and how it's been related to COVID, well, I guess since the beginning, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, and since it's kind of, you know, winding down, there's some questions, some natural questions of, are they still going to do this program? Because, of course, during COVID, we talked a lot about the wastewater testing and the levels of COVID being found and how valuable that is. And early on in COVID, Boise worked to analyze the amount of COVID that they found there. And it's impressive technology that actually yields really some high quality data. And that data showed surges of COVID in cities, which helped medical experts and city leaders make their informed decisions. But a big question, is that program now a footnote of history? Long story short, City of Boise says no. We've built it up over time as a pretty core program that we have, and we are continuing to send to a couple of different labs. We're still primarily focused on COVID. We've built up such a good trend of data now that we want to continue that and see benefit in that, especially with some of the variant analysis as well. We are evaluating other uh, possibilities for other public health indicators, things like influenza and RSV, um, but, but not quite in a public kind of facing space on that yet. So yes, the program has a lot of room to grow and show more data sets. And something that was actually mentioned early on in the program back at the beginning of COVID, and one of you texted in about this, was the possibility of showing opioid levels in our water. So is this happening in Boise now? That was certainly kind of the uh, beginning of our relationship with one of the labs that was doing this work as we had been introduced to them now years ago about that possibility and it wasn't a, the right fit for the city at the time. Um, certainly that possibility exists, but that's not something that we've been asked to do recently. So uh, whoever texted in, I can't remember your name, but there's your answer. So to expand on that though, flu, RSV data, maybe more down the road with maybe some opioid data. So it kind of depends on what the demands of the community are. But with the investment in this technology, what is the value right now as COVID is winding down? I think it continues to have this broad public health uh, data set value. I think what we've, um, in addition to having this trend over time and the changing kind of state of what we're seeing specifically around COVID, but the two benefits that I think we may not have predicted, but certainly have been beneficial and will continue into the future are the relationships that we formed and the partnerships with public health agencies, with other agencies that we can really leverage wastewater data as a community um, asset that's, that's anonymized, but community-wide in a way that other data can be really difficult to gather. So, Brian, a little bit of a tease. Next week, we are going to circle back to this conversation because there's a lot of new stuff to talk about on this topic, I'm told. Hmm. It's in the works at Public Works. It is. I nailed it. Close the lid on that. I worked on that all day, Brian. Thanks, Joe.
Exploring Idaho wasn't just about showing off the Gem State's beautiful places over the years, but it was also about showing off the great people and the traditions that go along with it, like ranching. Staple industry the state's held on to, obviously, since the beginning. Today, we're taking you to Peekaboo, a small town in central Idaho where ranching has been around for more than 100 years, and it's one of the oldest traditions that they have, the cattle drive. So how did they do it 28 years ago? Well, we're going to take you to the Purdy Ranch to show you. Oh, cattle. And every time I get up in the morning, I have something to do. Ow! Oh, oh come back! I don't have to worry about what I'm going to do. I have to do something and keep you going. Huh. Out on the range, it takes fast moves and a unique language to round up cattle. Watch out. Watch it. And at nearly 80 years old, Bud Purdy has a lot of practice. Oh! Ha! Ha! He's been working this land since the Great Depression, and in 60 years, he's never let a cow get the best of him. Uh. Well, almost never. Today, the newest addition to the K Bar K Ranch is moving out. Hey. These calves and their mamas are headed to another range for the summer, but some are a little confused about which way to go. The calves, they don't, they want to run back. They don't want to go. A crew of cowboys helps Bud bring his cattle in. And another helper is a little camera shy, but not so shy about nipping cows into line. Get them salt. Get them out of there. Today's drive is a short one. Well, we made it anyway. And back at the corral, cowboys trade their horses for cattle prods. And with a poke, a push, and only one escape, herd the cows into a chute. Up into a truck, hop, hop. Easy. and off to the range down the road, where they'll do it all again another day. With the hard work finished for today, Bud takes a walk along Silver Creek. There's some yellow blackbirds there, yellow winged or yellow headed. They just showed up. Nearly seven miles of this creek run through his property. It's home to dozens of birds, trout, even muskrat, a healthy stream for all the cattle that graze nearby. We're just kind of paying attention to what we're doing. I think that's the main thing. Fences keep cattle from tromping the creek bed. Willows planted at water's edge offer shade and habitat for insects. Those insects make good food for trout. I want someone to enjoy them in the future, just like I have. And, uh, that's, that's really what, what I want. The fishing was good 100 years ago when Bud's grandfather homesteaded this land. Today, Silver Creek remains one of the best fishing streams in the area. And Bud Purdy stands out as an example to other ranchers of how to work the land and care for the land. So again and again, his family can hand it down. When I'm gone, I just, I just love to think, think that this uh, stream would be like this for right on through, whatever that is. I know Mountain Express said the Purdy Ranch was founded by Bud Purdy's grandfather, W.H. Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick, I should say, and his two brothers all the way back in 1883. When they came to Idaho to build a railroad. Bud Purdy came to work on the ranch as a ranch hand after he got a business degree at the University of Washington and said he couldn't find any other job. So he bought the ranch outright in 1955, became a ranching legend in Blaine County. He's also a pretty avid hunter, apparently taking Hemingway bird hunting around Silver Creek, as you heard him talk about. He's also a pilot, still flew his airplane at the ripe age of 95. I was fortunate enough to meet him in 2012 when he was 94 years old. Sadly, the next year, in April of 2014, he died at the age of 96.
I know Steelheads are set to return to home ice tonight, which was originally supposed to be game three in Boise, but was now called game two after game two was canceled over the weekend in Texas. That was where they were going to set to play the Allen Americans on Saturday. As some of the team were heading to the arena, there was that shooting. It broke out at the mall. Just down the road, eight people were killed. Idaho is now going to play at home for games two, three, four, and five. After winning that game one in Texas, Steelheads are back on the ice this morning where they are going to be sporting a new feature on their gear, both in practice and tonight. Special stickers on their helmets to show their support for the Allen, Texas community. After an emotional few days, Coach Everett Sheen shared the mindset heading into the game tonight. I believe for the rest of the playoffs, uh, we'll be wearing ribbons tonight too as well, just to show solidarity with the Allen community down there and show our support. At this point right now, it's just a regular game day. We got to get ready to, to do our job tonight. You know, it was um, unfortunate to be a part of that down in Allen. You know, our thoughts and prayers are down there. Um, at the end of the day, we, we have a job that we need to get back to doing, and today's game day, so we got to get ready to go. Puck drop tonight at 7:10, and we're going to have post-game details and possibly highlights tonight on the news at 10. Let's get right to your comments today. A couple of you had some some things to say about Ammon Bundy and his case. Let me get this straight. Ammon Bundy has made his money scaring people about the federal government, and now he wants to move his court case to the federal court. Isn't his 15 minutes up yet, says Scott? Well, not quite, because it's still going to be drug out, I guess, a little bit. I did ask him today about how far he intends to take this. If the federal government or federal court says they don't want to hear his case, is he then going to turn himself in? He said, nope, he's going to keep appealing this. So, no, his 15 minutes is not up. And why he isn't arrested? A lot of you asked it, have asked. Well, I guess he told the Jim County Sheriff he wants to see what happens with this federal court filing. And then maybe we'll see some action. I did ask Jim County Sheriff why. Haven't heard back yet. We'll see you tomorrow.